before I start, uh, I think I'm going to ask for something. I don't know if it can be done. Can we have some music? <laughs> These horns, can somebody make them work? <laughs> okay, let me tell you what I, I would like. Um, just before we started, Chikwe did a very moving tribute to Madiba. And um, we all sat in silence and listened. I've been very honored to have met him three times, personally, and twice to have actually had a conversation. And uh, with all sorts of things that have been said about, um, you know, he's seen different, different activities and different sectors and different events and different attributes which is used to build peace and reconciliation and build a nation. But there's one thing that he also used powerfully and that is music. And the people of South Africa understand that. And they also understand that a great man has passed. Uh, if you look at almost all his uh, photographs, he's dancing somewhere. So let us get up and dance to Madiba. Come on. <laughs> And the music has to be good. <laughs> Mandela is gone. Long live Mandela. Thank you. Thank you. Now, today, um, I think most of you who know me usually listen to me talk about a new Africa, a rising Africa, a hopeful Africa. And that's usually the kind of topic I try to talk about for our young people, precisely because of what Chikwe said. We are fed a diet these days by our own selves of negativity about ourselves, and we must not allow that to stand. But I also think that a mature people are not afraid to talk of the difficult issues that confront them. Isn't that so? So today I'm going to depart a little bit from my talks on Africa, because I have a lot of young Africans here and lovers of Africa. So I'm, I want to talk about a difficult topic. That topic is talked about uh, by non-Africans, but even more frequently by Africans themselves. And it's gotten so critical that sometimes when you mention the name Africa, or even the name of my country, Nigeria, you mentioned the word corruption, isn't it? I want to talk about corruption today. It's a difficult topic. It's a risky topic. But I think we are mature enough to have a talk about it. As the continent does better, as we have Africa rising and growing, we also struggle with issues of creating jobs. We have a long way to go. We are talking about growth, but we actually need to grow faster to be able to make an appreciable dent on poverty. We need to, as I said, create jobs, include those who are at the bottom of the ladder. We are struggling with so many problems. And I think that 
Governance and corruption issues are also part of that. And we need to grapple and talk about some of the root causes and have a sensible conversation about this. So firstly, speaking for my continent, for my country, and even for other countries globally, we have to admit that in most cases, corruption is a problem. It's not tagged to a particular set of people. We all know, whether we're here in the UK, the US, Nigeria, other African countries, that this exists in one form or the other. And the issue is the set of laws and the will we have to fight it. But speaking for my country, yes, we have to say yes, that we have problems. And that corruption undermines development in Nigeria, on the continent. It deprives us from resources with which we can fight poverty and create wealth for people. When a civil servant demands under the table money for a service that they should deliver, they diminish the service and they diminish the people they serve. This is corruption. When a teacher demands sexual favors to give a student high marks in an exam or to pass them, they diminish the student. They diminish themselves. They undermine education. They undermine development. This is corruption. When a public servant diverts resources from the state budget or the national budget and sends the resources abroad, siphons them abroad, removes them from the ability to do work and do good for the people. This is corruption on the part of the person siphoning, but also on the part of those receiving abroad or at home. When people steal our mineral wealth, be it oil or other natural resources in any of our countries on the continent, and they divert this, again, send it abroad. That's corruption on the part of those stealing and receiving. When companies illegally refuse to pay taxes or find clever ways to take out the profits and resources which they ought to pay in the country they are working, this is also corruption. When a businessman supports a politician or politics in return for inordinate access to contracts or resources when the person wins, this is also corruption. All of this undermines development and um, undermines the very fabric of our society. But there's one thing I want to mention that I think is very important, and that is what I call the trivialization of corruption. What do I mean by that? This thing, trivializing corruption, is going on mightily in some of our countries right now. You trivialize co corruption when there's evidence transparently that an act or a policy is legitimate. And yet, for your own purposes, either politically or otherwise, you choose to label it corruption. And you divert attention from the real issues for people to focus on things that are not issues. That is when you trivialize corruption. When you use it as a weapon with which to try and castigate other people, when the evidence is there transparently that this is not the case, that's trivializing corruption. Let me just give you an example. You saw the Chikwe put up a whole series of newspapers with their negative reports. That doesn't mean all newspapers are bad. Some are good. Some reporters and journalists are good. But I had an example recently of this trivialization from one of our national newspapers, the Punch newspaper, when they said that a government policy where we give incentives 
to industries or to business people to try and spur them to invest in the economy was a bunch of corruption. And yes, in the past, it wasn't a good policy. No, you had people who would come and get particular incentives to spur their businesses, and it would give them an undue advantage over others. We call them waivers and exemptions. They would get an advantage. Their businesses would get an advantage because they had a particular uh, exemption to give them an incentive to do their job. So two years ago, we looked at this. And uh, in the economic management team in Nigeria, we said, and the president totally agreed, that this doesn't work very well, that this gives undue advantage, creates an unlevel playing field. And we decided that we would reform this so that we would decide what are the sources of growth, which sectors are likely to help the economy the most. And then we would grant these exemptions and incentives within those sectors. And the key, anybody working with the sector would be entitled to get it. So we reformed, and we are still in the process of strengthening and reforming this. It's not perfect, but it's come a long way. Now, this is now a whole new sectoral policy. So when the newspaper wrote an editorial and said this was a cesspit of corruption, we pointed out, yes, in the past, it wasn't good. But now we've been running a different system for two years. They dared us to publish those who got these waivers. And guess what? Last week, we sent it to them. We did. But do you know what? They refused to even look at it and continued to insist that this was a cesspit of corruption. Why am I telling this story? Because if you spend so much time trivializing an issue when the evidence is in front of you, then that is not doing a good service. So Lem, those who want to look at this can go on the budget website or even on in the internet and you see this publication. I'll spend some time on this story because I think we need to be mindful ourselves to not divert our attention from the serious issues which we confront and with which we have to deal and spend our time on the trivialization of what is truly an important issue. Now, I want to move to one aspect of this important issue that we need to have a conversation about. And that is an aspect of one of the underlying sources of root, or roots of corruption, which we don't talk about very much. And I want the young people on the continent to truly think about it. This is how we finance our democracy, how we finance our elections. We all want democracy in our countries, don't we? And we have worked very hard on the continent to have this. So many countries now practice multi-party democracy, we have elections, and it's the only form that can deliver for us a voice for the people. So we want it. But have you ever thought of how elections are financed? No country has been able to crack this problem. In the US, they've had conversations about campaign finance, and they've tried to reform. They've got a system but I'm sure they'll admit it's not perfect in the UK, in so many other countries. But at least in these countries, they're having a conversation about it, isn't it? And they're talking about what to do to make it better. On the continent, how many of you have thought about this issue and whether we are doing it right and the way it's happening? How many? Has anyone even thought about this? Well, one, to me, of the root causes of corruption on the continent is the way that we finance or do not finance elections properly. We've adopted systems that demand that politicians campaign, haven't we? Campaigns cost money, but where does that money come from? If we don't find a legitimate means of supporting campaigns, then all sorts of ways are found to do this. It could be as I said before, engaging business people who support you or support a system or a party, and then later on they have to be rewarded through contracts or other means that may actually not help 
but may undermine the economy and undermine development. We haven't found an answer to this problem, but the silence in this room gives me concern. That's why I wanted to talk about it, because for the next generation, you have to think about it. It means we haven't even begun to have the kind of conversation and to see that if we don't solve this problem, people will continue to find unorthodox means of financing the elections, of financing the implantation of democracy, and that these very means may be at the root cause of some of the corruption we do not want and may totally undermine the way we do business. So I want us to think about this, to think about ways, to think about means. If we want democracy to continue to thrive on our continent, if we want to deal with some of the root causes of corruption, we've also got to think of how we finance that very good that we want. And I want us to start a conversation about it. I'm sorry to start your day with such a sober topic. <laughs> but I think this is the right group and the right audience, isn't it? You know, I want us to start a conversation. You know, what if we decide that a certain percentage of our revenues off the top in each of our countries should be dedicated to this purpose? And that people need not run around to look for means and stress themselves to finance political parties or election campaigns, but that it is a legitimate good. It's a legitimate public good that we have said we want in each country. We want democracy. And therefore, we must find a legitimate way to support this. What if we said we would do that? Is that a way? What other ways can we think about? How can we have this conversation? How can we innovate? We've got so many young people on our continent with innovative ideas. All of you in the audience here, look at this TEDx. Is this not creativity? Is this not innovation? If we can do things like this, if we can have Ushahidi in Kenya, which helped to track political violence and is now using applications all the way in Haiti, if we can have this wonderful discovery that a young Ghanaian made that helps us detect fake drugs and saves lives, if we can have the application on budget that a young Nigerian has put together that enables us to understand our budget system better, if we can have these and many more applications, if we can use technology to solve our problems, if we can think and put together knowledge that puts us ahead, why can't Africa be a leader in thinking and innovating on how to legitimately finance elections? I want you to join this conversation. Please go to innovatedemocracyafrica.org. Let me say that again, innovatedemocracyafrica.org and share your ideas about how we can finance our democracy better, how we can root out a budding source of corruption in our society, and share any other ideas you have about how to solve the problem. Let me end by saying this. We must take personal responsibility for the issue. Too often I see people think that it's them. You know, it's someone else. It's the government. It's that other person. On my Twitter, I get lots of messages saying, why don't you do this? And why don't you do that? Well, you know what I said, the reason why I came back to government? I felt that even if the environment is difficult, if there's one little thing I can do to plug a hole, solve a problem, even if it's small, it is meaningful. If there's one little thing you can do, don't shy away. If you can come in government and help solve something, don't think someone else is there to solve it for you. If you can do it from civil society, and I mean legitimate civil society, not non-governmental individuals, you know? Those that are for hire, you know, saying they're civil society but really perpetrating something else. You know what I mean. If you can solve it from civil society, if you can solve it from the media, if as a media person you can observe principles, if you can say you're not for sale, if you can tell the truth, if you can use the means to galvanize action, please do it. 
It is you who has to, you have to take responsibility. I have to take responsibility. We can't leave it to someone else. We have to solve this problem. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>